Okay, good afternoon. So um, <clears throat> I will now have the finish uh, with uh, the part about rings by finishing the section about uh, irreducibility of polynomials, and then we start with fields and field extensions. So the last thing that we proved was uh, the Eisenstein criterion. I think you will still remember it. And now we want to give some other simpler criteria to check that polynomials are irreducible. So a few more at ah, this time. A few other methods or simple methods to check irreducibility of polynomials. So the first one is just ad hoc. So um, this is the following remark. So if you have a polynomial of degree 2 or 3, if it uh, is reducible, then it must have a 0. So if f in kx now, in moment, for moment case, any field is a polynomial of degree 2 or 3, then it follows, uh, then F is reducible, so not irreducible if and only if f has a 0 in k. That's quite obvious, because if f is, redu is reducible, so obviously if f has, um, I mean, this direction is trivial. If f has a 0 in k, then uh, you can take you can uh, divide it by x minus that 0. We have seen that before. And so it's reducible. So if f is reducible, then this means we can write f is equal to g times h with uh, f and g, with g and h uh, polynomials of positive degree. degree at least 1. So as the degree of uh, f is 2 or 3, one of these two degrees must be 1. Um, g is equal to 1, or the degree of h is equal to 1. And so obviously this is uh, and then that means, for instance, obviously it's symmetric whether it's G or H. So if H has degree 1, that means that uh, H can be written as AX plus B for A and B elements in K. And then uh, B divided by A is 0 of K. Okay, so this is very simple. Now, if all, it's not so obvious to see that a polynomial does not have a zero. I mean, at least a polynomial of degree two, maybe you might be able to do that, but probably polynomial of degree three, it might be some difficulty. But one thing you can see, on the other hand, we had this uh, exercise. So if um, f in uh, is a polynomial with integer coefficients is monic, 
we can write f equal to sum uh, as say x to the n plus sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 say a i x to the i. So monic means precisely that the leading coefficient is uh, 1. So then it was an exercise we think so I said that that first in that case um, if uh, a in q is a zero of f then a is actually an integer. Um, so, and uh, and furthermore, we have that a divides the coefficient a zero in z. We find this by division with rest. Okay. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say, but <laughs> okay. So this was an exercise. And uh, so thus, for instance, if you have a, a, a monic, so thus, if f in zx is monic of degree smaller or equal to 3, well, say of degree 3, degree 2, I think you can deal with. Anyway, then... Um, f is irreducible if and only if none of the none of the divisors of the constant term which i may still call a0 of a0 is a0 of f and obviously this you can directly check so you know, you know, your a0 is just one integer, so it will have a small number of divisors. You can just check for every one of them if you put it into polynomial whether it gets zero or not. And if you don't, then the polynomial is irreducible. None. Okay. So if we take, for instance, f equal to x to the 3, so this would also work with the Eisenstein criterion, but it doesn't matter, plus 2x minus 2, if I'm not mistaken. So the divisors of the constant term are... Uh, what is it? 1, minus 1, 2, and minus 2. And if you put each of them into the polynomial, you don't get 0. And so uh, it follows f is irreducible. So this is a kind of trivial way to check irreducibility in some cases. Now I want to have a slightly, ever so slightly more interesting way to get some example which we will use later, so this is the following remark. It's also simple. So let's again, now we are, have a general field. So let f, say, the polynomial sum i equals 0 to n, a i x to the i, be some polynomial with coefficients in the field k. So the, and um, <clears throat> we give ourselves an element, A and K. So we can just make a new polynomial out of F by shifting it by A. So we take, uh, so we put, um, so we say that then F is irreducible. Reducible over k, so in kx, if and only if, if I replace the variable of f by x plus a, if that is irreducible. Over k, 
And this is, uh, so f of x plus a is the obvious thing. You just take this into place x by x plus a. So this is uh, defined to be i equals 0 to n, a i, x plus a to the i. Obviously, this is also a polynomial. And um, this is clear. Because if I take the map, say I call it sigma a, from kx to kx, which sends uh, any polynomial g to g of x plus a, so the variable x is replaced by x plus a, this is, uh, as you can easily see, an isomorphism of rings. So you can easily see that it's a homomorphism of rings. If you take the sum of two polynomials, you get the sum. And if you apply it to the product, you get the product. This is basically by definition. So it's obviously a homomorphism, and it's an isomorphism because the inverse is what one can immediately imagine. You sh shift, it for, shift it by a, and you can shift it back by main, minus a. Inverse is sigma minus a. So, and so as it's an, in, uh, if you have an, iso you have an isomorphism of rings, then obviously it sends irreducible elements to irreducible elements and reducible to, irre to reducible ones. Because if, you have, if something is a product of two elements, then it will, the, in the image it will be the product of the image element. So thus it preserves irreducibility. Thus um, f is irreducible if and only if f of x plus a or I could now call it sigma a of f, is irreducible. I want to apply this in one example, which later we'll have to do with, uh, if we want to deal with it with uh, dealing with roots of unity. So example, uh, so let p be a prime number in Z. So then we can look at the polynomial F, which I just uh, take X to the P minus one plus X to the P minus two plus and so on, plus one, okay? So plus X plus one. So just take all the powers of X from P minus one to one. There's a plus here. So <clears throat> I claim that this is irreducible in Q of X. So it's an irreducible polynomial over Q. And we want to do this uh, by using this remark. So obviously, I mean, as you have learned uh, either in high school or in the first year of university, you will find, you know that x minus 1 times f is equal to x to the p minus 1, well, beginning of some geometric series. <coughs> so if I, uh, now I can apply to this uh, sigma 1 to this. So if I take x times sigma 1 of f, so sigma 1 was this map uh, x goes to x plus 1, uh, this will be x plus 1 to the p minus 1, which you can write down in terms of binomial coefficients, uh, sum Yeah, so, so this is x times this. Now I divide it by x, so I get sigma 1 of f is equal to this divided by x. So this is sum i equals 1 
to P. Uh, the binomial coefficient P choose I times X to the I minus 1. No? So if you take this one, this would be the sum from I equals 0 to P. P choose I times X to the I. And now we subtract the constant term and divide by X, so we get this. So you, I hope you remember, I mean, it, I'm not quite sure whether in all countries the notation for binomial coefficients is the same. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, as, no, as long as you know what it is. So uh, P choose I, you can write this as P times P minus 1 times times uh, P minus I plus 1 divided by I factorial, so I times I minus 1 times 1. No? Okay. <clears throat> so it's a standard exercise um, that uh, such a thing, uh, if, uh, if you take P choose I for a prime number, this will, uh, unless I is equal to 0 or P, this will always be divisible by P. So, it's, and it's easy to check that P divides P choose I for 1 smaller or equal to I smaller or equal to P minus 1. And obviously, P squared does not divide P choose 1, which is just P. So we are in the situation, <clears throat> um, and obviously P does not divide P choose P, which is 1. So we are precisely in the situation where the Eisenstein criterion applies. So the Eisenstein criterion Uh, gives us that um, sigma 1 of f is irreducible and thus this kind of uh, uh, <coughs> this polynomial here uh, is I mean f is irreducible And, uh, you know, this somehow means if you <coughs> want to take a number which is not 1, uh, such that x to the p is equal to 1, then this will, let me see. Yeah. I mean, if p is bigger than 1, then this will not be a, a irrational number. If p is equal to 1, this polynomial is also irreducible, but in that case, it's of degree 1, so it still has a 0. Okay, now let's, uh, so that was as much as I wanted to say for the moment about these polynomials. So let us now start uh, to talk about fields. And what we really will be talking about is field extensions. So we want to talk about field extensions. So I first say the field extension is just that you have two fields. So you have K is a field contained in a field L, such that K is a subfield L. So a subfield of L just means a field which is a subring of L. Um, so and K and L are fields. So we are interested in studying such field extensions, in particular somehow field extensions which has to do with 
polynomials, for instance, uh, one question you one could ask oneself, assume we have a polynomial in Kx, say an irreducible polynomial in Kx, and we want to find the field extension of K such that this field extension might, might be called L, such that in L the polynomial has a zero. And you want to study whether this is possible, you know, whether this is possible or what one can say about such fields and so on. Okay. So first now I want to give the uh, proper definitions. And uh, okay, I don't think I need this now. Yeah. So let's talk about field extensions and the degree theorem. Later we come to the degree theorem. So, <clears throat> so first, you know, I have already kind of said in words what the field extension is, but let me say it correctly. Uh, I mean, explicitly as a definition. So, definition. A subring K of a field L is called a Yeah, do I want this? Uh, <coughs> a subfield. You no, know, if it is a subring, uh, it's called a subfield of L. So a, a subfield of a uh, of a field is just a subring, which happens to be a field. And on the other hand, we usually want to view it the other way around. We want to view not k as a subthing of L, but L as an extension of k. So in this case, we call uh, uh, L a field extension of k. And uh, we write also that L over K is a field extension. Okay, this is this field extension. <coughs> and um, So if um, assume we have such a thing, so if, um, if L over K and large K over K are field extensions, we will later be interested in homomorphisms between L and K, which are the identity uh, between L and large K, which are the identity on small K. So a homomorphism of rings and thus of fields, uh, phi from K to L is called a K homomorphism. If it's the identity on small k is equal to the identity so if I take any element a in small k then phi of a is equal to a um, and uh, in the same way we have k isomorphism so it's an, an isomorphism which is the identity on K and K automorphism, which would be an automorphism, so of say large K to itself, which is the identity on small K. 
later we will find that these K automorphisms form a nice group, which uh, uh, we will have to study in, in order to study the uh, field extensions. So, <clears throat> okay, so that's one thing. Now, um, there's one thing. If we have such a field extension, uh, one re obvious, very easy remark is that if L over K is a field extension, then L is a K vector space. And then we can be interested in the dimension of this K vector space. So, remark. Let uh, L over K be a field extension. So, then let's just look at the axioms that we have. So, we have that L with the addition is an abelian group. No, because uh, a field with addition is an abelian group. And we can look at the, for the multiplication, we can just restrict the multiplication of L times L to L to a multiplication from K times L to L. And uh, restriction of the multiplication uh, on L to K times L gives uh, this multiplication times from uh, K times L to L, which is somehow, you know, we want to see that L is a K vector space. So this would be the scalar multiplication, uh, such that uh, a few axioms are fulfilled uh, just because we are, after all, it is a field and we have a few actions and we can just specialize them. Uh, so such that we have the following uh, rules. We have such that we have the distributive laws following hold so we have the distributive laws um, this is just if I take uh, say a plus b which are now a and b elements in k times an element x in l so we have a b in k x y in L, such a plus is equal to a x plus b x. This is just a special case of the distributive law in L. And we have if I have a times x plus y is equal to a x plus a y. And we have the associative law. If we take a times b, mm-hmm, Law. If I take A times B, A and B are elements in K times an element X, this is the same as taking A times B times X. This is just because in L we have the associative law and we just restrict it. And finally, we know if we take 1 in K times any element X, this is equal to X. Because after all, 1 is the neutral element of L. And so, if you look at the, if you try to remember what you learned in your first years of uh, university, you find out that these are precisely the axioms for a vector space. For L being a K vector space. So, thus we have that L is a K vector space. Um, and so, then the dimension 
of L as a k-vector space, we will call the degree of the field extension. So let me write this down, definition. Let L over k be a field extension. So the degree, which is denoted very similar to what we did for rings, L over k, uh, for groups, that was called index. Uh, the degree L over k, but it's slightly different. Anyway, the degree L over k uh, of L over k is the dimension of L as k vector space, where we, where obviously this degree can therefore also be infinite if the dimension is infinite. So where we have that L over k is equal to infinity if uh, L is not a finite dimensional vector space. So this degree, which is a number, which is possibly infinite, is an invariant which you can associate to every field extension. So let's see what we can see about this number. The first obvious, so, ah, and we call uh, L over K a finite extension. If this dimension so this degree is finite. So not L over K. So the extension we call a finite extension if the index is finite. So if L is a finite dimensional K vector space. And one stupid remark is that if L over K is equal to one, then L is equal to K. It's kind of uh, essentially, I mean, it's in some sense completely obvious because uh, so if, uh, if L over K is equal to one, then it means that this is a, that uh, L is a one dimensional K vector space and uh, as a basis, we can take the element one in L. So, so the elements of L are just one multiplied with any element of K, and this is K. Okay, so <clears throat> now we want to ask ourselves what happens to this degree if we kind of make several field extensions one after, after another. So we take L, an extension of K, and large K, an extension of L. So what is the relation between the different degrees? And again, this is similar to what we had for the index of subgroups. <coughs> So first I just introduce one more word which will often be used. So it's just a different way of saying something again. Definition. So let um, say large K over K be a field extension.
and let uh, L over K be a field extension with uh, uh, L is actually a subfield is contained in K. Then we call L an intermediate field. of the field extension large k over k. Now obviously it lies between large k and small k. <coughs> and so now we can, and so the <coughs> degree theorem will tell us in this situation, if you have k which contains L, which contains small k, what, how the degrees of these things are related to each other. So and it's not very, so the theorem is quite simple. Degree theorem so let L be an intermediate field of an extension K large K over small K. Um, then the degree of large K over small K is equal to the degree of large K over L multiplied with the degree of L over small K. Um, here, obviously, it might be that these field extensions are infinite, so I always say that uh, for n in z some positive integer, I have infinity times infinity is equal to infinity times n is equal to uh, n times infinity is equal to infinity. No, just that's uh, the convention so that this holds. So if any of these numbers is infinite, then uh, I mean, if any on this side is infinite, then also this is infinite, and if uh, this is infinite, then one of these two must be infinite. So in particular, we have that the extension k over k is a finite extension. if and only if uh, both of these are finite, if and only if L, so large K over L, and L over small K are both finite extensions. Okay, so this is almost more difficult to state then to prove. So first, <clears throat> I'm actually not really interested very much in the case that any of these numbers is infinite, so it's mostly interesting the case for finite extensions. And it's kind of obvious also that, uh, so that if, uh, so, to prove. If k over L is not finite or L over k is not finite, then it's clear that uh, k over small k is not finite because uh, you, know, you can also you find here you find an infinite set of elements in large k which are linearly independent over l then they are also linearly independent over k or you find an <coughs> infinite set 
of elements in L, which are linearly independent over small k, then this is also an infinite set of elements of large k, which are linearly independent over small k. So in any case, you find if you have any of these two degrees is infinite, then this degree is infinite. So thus, we can assume that both these numbers are finite. So maybe I should have done it with the index, though, because that's really what I meant. So as we assume that these are both finite, so that, say, now I write a term that L over K, small k, and K over L are both finite extensions. Okay, then we need to show that um, uh, k over k is a finite extension and that the dimension is the product of the of these two indices, of these two uh, degrees. Well, we just do this by exhibiting a basis. So let, so we assume, so let, uh, so the degree of L over k to be n and the degree of uh, k over l to be m. And uh, so we choose a basis, first of this over this. So let x1 to xn be a basis of l over k, so as of l as a k vector space. And uh, y1 to ym be a basis of k as an L vector space. And we want to show that by taking all possible products of these elements, we get a basis of k over small k. If we take the set of all x, i, y, j, from i goes from 1 to n, and j goes from 1 to m is a basis. Of a large k as a small k vector space. Well, if you want to show that something is a basis, we have to show that it generates the vector space and that the elements are linear independent. And so we just do it. So first I show they generate. k vector space. So I must be able to write any element in large k as a linear combination uh, of elements of, of these things with coefficients in small k. So if I take, so if, say, y is an element in k, we can write y equal, say, sum i equal 1 to, which one was it? To m, b, j, y, j. For some elements, b, j in l. This is, you know, as the y, j's are basis, I can write any element in K as a linear combination with coefficients in L of these. Now, for each of these uh, BJs, I can do the same and express them in terms of elements of small k. And for all j, um, we can write BJ as sum, so this was a j, 
um, i equals 1 to n a i j x i. This is again just the x i form a basis so where the a i j obviously are elements in k. This is again because the x i form a basis of L over small k. And so any element of L, in particular Bj, can be written as a linear combination of them. So now we just put this into each other. So thus, we have that our given element y can be written by right, putting this description into this. So this is the sum of all i equal, uh, so say, i from 0 to n, sum of all j from, z, from 1, 1 to m, a i j, x i times y j. And so we have indeed written y as a linear combination of these products x i times y j. So they generate. And now we have to show that they are linearly independent. It's kind of basically, I mean, a similar Maybe only easier, but just does it step by step. So they are linearly independent. So if some aij xi times yj is equal to 0, one, so i and j go again from 0, from 1 to n and from 1 to m. If I have such a linear combination which is 0 with the elements aij, in K, then we can first, uh, <clears throat> we know that these YJ are linear independent. So if I have any combination of the YJs, which is zero, then the coefficients of each YJ must be zero. So as the YJ are linearly independent over L, we find that, you know, and we have some combination of them which is zero, we find that all the coefficients are zero. It follows sum i, a i j, x i is equal to zero for all j. And now we apply this again, these x i, are linear independent over k. And we have a linear combination of them, which is 0. Um, over k, we have that uh, it follows that sum that a i j is equal to 0 for all i and j. Okay, so that was quite simple. In some sense, I think, you know, it's the obvious thing one would think of doing if one would be given this as an exercise. But anyway, <coughs> that's it. As a corollary, we get, uh, I just want to mention, like we did for the groups, um, Corollary, if um, k over k is a finite field extension, and uh, L is an intermediate field,
then clearly we have that, uh, I don't know which one I wanted, that uh, say L over K divides uh, K over K. In the same way also large K over K. So anyway, that's clear, no, because the product, uh, because of the degree theorem. And so in particular, if uh, K over K is a prime number, there are no intermediate fields except for large K and small K itself. Okay, so there's nothing I have to say to this. It's kind of completely obvious. <coughs> so anyway, so this degree theorem is a not very deep result, but it's very useful, obviously, to, uh, you know, because it gives us some kind of way how to see whether certain field extensions can be there and to compare them and so on. So now I want to talk about algebraic field extensions and then uh, simple algebraic extensions. So, you know, a field extension L over K will be called algebraic if every element in L is a zero of a non-zero polynomial with coefficients in K. Okay, and then well, we will say later what this is. So let me set this up. So for the moment, we fix in a field extension. I mean, for, for the argument now, we field, fix a field extension k over small k. So we say an element a in the bigger field will be called algebraic over the smaller field if it's the zero of a non-zero polynomial. So if there exists a non-zero polynomial um, F uh, in so which would be some i equal zero to n a i x to the i um, with um, in with coefficients in the smaller field uh, with f of a is equal to zero. So that means some i from zero to n. A i, a to the i. Maybe you should have called that b because it's a bit confusing. B i a to the i is equal to zero. Okay. <coughs> and uh, okay, so these we will be interested in such algebraic elements. Otherwise, um, A is called uh, transcendent, if I can spell that, over K. Uh, 
and k is called an algebraic extension um, of k if all the elements of k are algebraic over small k. large k are algebraic over k. So, you know, just uh, as examples, we have to take the, say, the square root of 3. This is uh, algebraic over q because it's a, a 0 of, uh, so if I take the square root over 3 in the real numbers, it's a 0 of the polynomial x squared minus 3. And if I take i, so the complex number i in C is algebraic, say, over q, because it's a 0 of the polynomial x squared plus 1. And um, you know, very celebrated theorem of about a hundred years ago is that, uh, for instance, number pi, you know, the circumflex of a of a circle is transcend is, I think it's called transcendental. I think is uh, transcendental. over q. This is, uh, however, much too difficult for us. I mean, I just mentioned it. <coughs> I think this was uh, proven a bit more than 100 years ago. <coughs> OK, so now we want to look, uh, uh, I mean, here we'll be looking also at simple algebraic extensions. Um, so we want to look. Uh, at extension which which are obtained by taking a field and adding to it one element, taking the smallest field which contains also this element. And so I want to um, introduce this first uh, for more than one element and then for one element and then we want to study them which are the simplest field extensions which we can imagine. So definition So we still remember that we have some field extension k over k somehow. So let a1 to a n be some elements of the bigger field. So the extension of the smaller field generated by a1 the n. So first, I say it loosely. Uh, is the smallest field uh, L, which contains the field K, and so the, for, the for smallest subfield. L of k, when I write it, which contains k and the elements a1 to a n. So this kind of saying, the smallest uh, subfields which contains them is just a different way of it's just supposed to mean it's the intersection of all subfields of, of L which contain these. It follows from the definition directly 
that the intersection of all such subfields L will again be a subfield which contains these elements, and it is then the smallest one which does it. Okay. Um, and this is denoted, uh, it is denoted K with round brackets A1 to AN. So by definition, this is a, a subfield of K, of large K, which contains small K and these elements. And it's a, and every other subfield of K, which, con which contains small K and all these elements, contains also this. So now let's look at the special case that we have only one element here. So we want to look at the subfield generated by just one element. And we want this to be an algebraic element. So definition. So let A in our element in the bigger field K be an be algebraic over K. over small k, then this field generated by this one element is called a simple algebraic extension. So we will <coughs> uh, We will actually very much study these. Will be, these simple algebra extensions will be very important for us for two reasons. The first one is that they are really simple. So they are easy to study and one can understand them. And the second reason is that in, under reasonable assumptions, all, uh, all, field, all finite field extensions are simple algebraic extensions. So that, you know, these things are simple and they are also everything. So therefore, we certainly should study them. So the last statement is not completely true, but almost. <clears throat> so they are important. Because they are first easy to study. And second, um, so almost all algebraic extension are simple algebraic extensions. I will explain in a moment what almost means, for instance. Uh, uh, so this is the theorem of the primitive element, which we will prove later. So if one makes some suitable assumptions, then every algebraic extension is a simple algebraic extension. And uh, now we will see that one can completely understand them. So we want to describe them explicitly. So now I want to describe explicitly uh, a simple algebraic extension generated by one element A. And it will be described explicitly in terms of the so-called minimal polynomial. So this is an irreducible polynomial with coefficients in the smaller field, with, uh, which is monic. So the constant, uh, the, the leading coefficient is 1. And you can completely describe the extension in terms of this polynomial. Okay. So let me first introduce this polynomial. So the polynomial, 
So we already had this, but I say it once more, a polynomial, say f with coefficients in the field k is monic, is called monic, uh, if its leading coefficient is 1. And um, so if f is a non-zero polynomial, then we, we can you know, turn it into a monic polynomial by dividing by the leading coefficient, obviously. So then there is a unique polynomial, say g, in Kx, which is monic, which generates the same idea. In Kx, that's kind of obvious. If I, <clears throat> we know that um, two polynomials, I mean two elements in a in a uh, integral domain. Uh, generate the same ideal if they differ only by multiplying by a unit. So that means two polynomials generate the same ideal if and only if they differ by, con by multiplying by a constant. And so in this case, I can just obtain g by taking f and dividing it by its leading coefficient. And that's obviously your unique. So now let us take an element A in our bigger field K, which is algebraic over the smaller field. And we can look at the evaluation homomorphism at A. So the evaluation homomorphism was I take a coefficient a polynomial with coefficients in the smaller field k, and we send it to k by sending f to f, I mean, yeah, of a. Every polynomial f is sent to the evaluation of the polynomial at a. We know that the evaluation is a ring homomorphism. So this is a ring homomorphism. Um, yeah. So we have assumed that A is algebraic so it means there is some polynomial some non-zero polynomial such that if I evaluate at A I get zero so the kernel of this homomorphism is non-zero kernel And this kernel is an ideal. And uh, so as this Kx is a, so this is uh, an ideal. So as Kx is a principal ideal domain, we know that this ideal is principal. So it's the ideal generated by unique element. So there is a unique, unique polynomial, a unique non-zero polynomial such that uh, it's generated by this. And if there's unique non-zero polynomial, there's unique uh, monic polynomial. F, we call it F A, such that uh, this kernel of the evaluation morphism is equal to the idea generated by F A. And F A is called 
the minimal polynomial. of A over K. Of A. Okay. So this is uh, this definition of the minimal polynomial. It's a bit uh, maybe roundabout. So therefore, we immediately will give another characterization, which is easier to remember and often to use. <coughs> but anyway, so if we take the, we have such an algebraic element over K, then the evaluation uh, at A has as kernel an ideal which is generated by a unique monic polynomial, and this is the minimal polynomial. And now let me give another characterization, which is what I just said before, that it's a unique irreducible monic polynomial with coefficients in small k, which vanishes there. Proposition. So let uh, this be on the same situation. We have an element in the bigger field, which is algebraic over the smaller field. So the minimal polynomial polynomial uh, FA of uh, A over k is the unique uh, irreducible monic polynomial uh, so f with coefficients in the smaller field such which vanishes at A. So the minimal polynomial is, uh, if, I mean, if I have an element which is algebraic over some field K, uh, then the minimal polynomial is a polynomial with coefficients in this smaller field, which is irreducible and monic and which vanishes at this element. And there is a unique such element, which uh, is the same as what I defined here. This is the claim. So the proof is not particularly difficult. I have to see that. So the first thing, um, so we take as FA the thing that we have defined here. So. In order to show, we have to show that uh, these two things are the same. So for this, I have to show that if I have um, uh, this element, then this is irreducible. So let FA be the minimal polynomial of A. So we have to show um, FA is irreducible. Then we have found that this is an irreducible monic polynomial. And uh, <coughs> no, OK. <coughs> And uh, then, on the other hand, we have to show if we have an irreducible monic polynomial with f of a equal to 0, we will have to show that it is uh, this generator of this idea. So let's first show this thing is irreducible. So, so assume f a is a product of two polynomials. We have to show that one of them has to be constant. No. Um, so we have zero. 
so we have um, so F A lies in the kernel of this evaluation homomorphism. So F A of A is equal to zero. So if we have that it's this product, we get this. So <clears throat> here we are in some, some field. So if the product of two things is zero, then one of them must be zero. Obviously, it doesn't matter which one I mean, we call G and H, so we can assume that G of A is equal to zero. I hope you remember the definition of the minimal polynomial. So say G of A is equal to zero. So then, you know, the uh, it means that G of A lies in the kernel of this evaluation homomorphism. So G lies thus. G is in the kernel of the evaluation at A, which was generated by F A. So it means that G is equal to L times F A for some polynomial L in Kx. But now we have F A is equal to G times H, and G is equal to L times F A. So we have that F A is equal to uh, H times L times F A. So that means H times L is equal to 1. And in particular, <coughs> it means that uh, this H was a unit. So H is a non-zero element in K. So K star, I don't know whether I introduced it, it's just, well, yeah, it's just the units of K. So this uh, shows that FA was irreducible. So <clears throat> conversely, in order to show this result, we have to show that uh, if we have an irreducible monic polynomial which vanishes, it's a generator of this idea of the kernel of the evaluation. Uh, so conversely, let uh, say G be a monic irreducible polynomial I mean in Kx with G of A is equal to zero then we have to see that uh, G is equal to our FA so it's a generator the unique monic generator of the kernel of the relation map Well, it's quite simple. G of A is equal to zero. So it follows that uh, G is in the kernel of the evaluation, which is the ideal generated by F A. So there exists again C and L in Kx such that G is equal to L times F A. But, um, you know, <clears throat> G was supposed to be irreducible. If G is irreducible, it cannot be written in a non-trivial way as a product of these things unless this is a constant. So it follows, so as G is irreducible, L is an element in K star. 
And now, however, both G and FA are monic. So the leading coefficient is 1. So if you want to find an element in, e, in K star so that you multiply 1 by it to get 1, the only possibility is 1. So G and FA harmonic FL is equal to 1. Okay, so this is this characterization of the mineral phenomena. How much time do I actually have? Ah, I'm a bit slower than I thought, actually considerably slower. So as an example, um, so let P be a prime number. Um, if we put, take some positive integer, then if we take the polynomial x to the n minus p, this is the minimal polynomial of the nth root of p over q, say. No, because this polynomial is irreducible by the Eisenstein criterion. And um, so it is, and it's monic, and so it's the minimal polynomial. So now I have not so much time. So which page is this? I'm actually not, oh, no, it's not so bad. Anyway, so now I will not be able to prove this theorem completely, but at least I can state it and let maybe see to start with the proof. So this is the kind of description of the simple algebraic extensions. So it's the following so description of simple algebraic extension. in terms of the minimal polynomial. So the theorem is as follows. So we have again element A k, algebraic over k. And uh, so with minimal polynomial FA. And we maybe remember fix the degree to be of, of the minimal polynomial. Then we have the following first, then first we have that Ka, so the simple algebraic extension generated by A is isomorphic to Kx divided the ideal generated by the minimal polynomial, something that we have kind of seen before. And the second statement is the degree of the field extension is equal to the degree of this polynomial. And in fact, we can give a basis of this field over this uh, and the elements 1, a, and so on until a to the m minus 1 are a basis of Ka over K. Okay, what can I do with this now? <clears throat> so this is the statement.
So one should note that this, in a suitable sense, completely describes this field. We know what the degree of the felt extension is, and we know precisely that, you know, what the ring structure is. We have this polynomial ring divided by this idea, and we can also um, <coughs> Okay, I don't have this. So, well, maybe I can prove the first part and then go on the next time. So, we have this evaluation homomorphism from Kx to K of A. So it goes first to K, but the image is obviously K of A because it's uh, uh, all expressed in terms of A, which sends G to G of A for any polynomial G. So this is a ring homomorphism. So it's a ring homomorphism. Um, whose kernel is uh, uh, the ideal generated by FA. You know that the kernel of the relation of A is the ideal generated by the minimal polynomial. So let now say L be the image of this map. So this is the image by evaluation of A to the whole of Kx. This will be a subring of uh, I can put on the K here. So a subring of K. So by uh, definition, so by uh, so the kernel is this, and the, this is the image. That, so we find that this L is isomorphic to Kx divided by this ideal. By the homomorphism theorem. We have that L is isomorphic as a ring to Kx modulo uh, this idea generated by Fa. So uh, this is what we have on this side. So we will want to prove that L is equal to K of A. And also that it's a field, obviously. Um, so S. Fa is irreducible. Uh, we have seen that it generates a maximal ideal in the principal ideal domain uh, Kx. So it follows that this L is a field. And um, if I, you know, identify the image of the constants under this map with K, because the, the map on the constant has, uh, you know, there's no kernel if I look at the constants. No, it's injective. So which contains K as a subfield? No, that's the image of the constant. Contains something isomorphic, but doesn't matter. 
And obviously, so it contains k as a subfield, and obviously, we also have that a, which is equal to um, the polynomial x applied to a is in this image. Is in, so, so, is, so which I could call is the evaluation at a of the polynomial x is in, in L. So that means L is a field which contains k and a. Okay, and so thus L contains k and a, and also by definition uh, L is contained in k of a because all the elements in L are just you know <coughs> you know polynomials in a. You, know, you you apply a polynomial to a, so this gives you an expression of a with uh, coefficients in k, so you stay in and L is contained in k of a. So thus, L is k of a. You know, if you take the evaluation morphism at a, it means you have some kind of linear combination with coefficients in k of powers of a. This certainly lies in the subfield generated by k and a. No? Because you have just uh, used field operations to elements of k and a. So certainly L is contained in k of a, and this does this. And so L is equal to k of a. So this proves uh, one. And then uh, we will next time do number two, which is actually maybe, well, it's not more difficult. And um, maybe also review the statement again. I think we see each other on Wednesday or something. Anyway, so thank you. <laughs>